so that's that's something that I uh, I cherish definitely. I think that I stopped sharing my screen somehow, but hopefully it'll come back. Great. Uh, just let me know if you experience any you know technical difficulties. I'll try to resolve them on the fly. So. It, Either way, at this time when you know entire industries are collapsing, people have more time to spend at home. The economy is changing, you know, and computer games and esports are kind of emerging victorious from this, you know, quality shift. Um, and in general, uh, being a lawyer within this industry, one must first first of all accept a certain wide range of risk. Uh, lack of regulation or perhaps some overregulation, uh, first of all, and some um, you have to accept also uh, the risk of not dealing or not covering uh, every every bit of um, of IP that they there might be used. Actually, you know, video games right now are huge, humongous, and evil even with you know, a set of superb lawyers, superb IP lawyers, it's often difficult to cover every, every bit of, uh, of IP that is used in game. As recently, as you know, uh, and if you have the opportunity to attend the uh, Monday's lecture uh, on cyberpunk, I, on cyberpunk's IP management uh, matters, you know, there was, a, there was an issue of a, a, a physical person's likeness being used without his direct permission. So that's, that's also important to, to consider. So what I would start with is a historical outline, first and foremost, oh, actually maybe I'll start with kind of introducing myself and the team. Uh, I myself am an advocate, uh, admitted to the bar in Poland over here, a uh, member of the Warsaw Bar Association, and as I mentioned, I've been working for the industry for a couple of years, uh, for the better part of the decade. Um, I'm part of the SSW team, which is uh, very much up, up and coming. Uh, we've been experiencing steady growth throughout the last couple of years. Uh, and I think that you know, the interactive entertainment practice, which I'm heading, is a, 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 good, uh, a good signal or a beacon of this growth. Um, so uh, this is more or less what we do. We do everything. <laughs> we do both law, taxes, technologies. We also have like a family office and we do also accounting and financing. So we're basically uh, a law firm plus, if you will. So uh, coming down to the, uh, to just the gist of the matter, uh, I'm going to put, uh, put you on a spot with a couple of, uh, I think, important cases from the uh, video game history. Uh, I'm going to look at what kind of IP rights there are or can be considered to be within a video game. And I'm going to show you a, a classical uh, dev pub or developmental publishing agreement. However, this, this particular agreement, you know, it's uh, from my early days from 2013 or 14. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, basically a development agreement for uh, for a, a full level of, of, of a AAA game. Uh, so we're gonna look at that for a moment. Uh, and then I'm gonna um, kind of this, this divulge into fringes of legal issues of, of the video game industry, such as uh, modding culture, user-generated content, uh, virtual currency, key reselling, you know, all these kind of regula regulatory issues uh, that you know are very much significant uh, in the long run. So uh, to give you a sense of what is the status quo, uh, what is basically a video game? So first of all, we, we play a game on some computer hardware to make things you know clear, uh, to get the obvious stuff uh, behind us. Uh, whether it's, it's a personal computer, a mobile phone, or you know. A, a piece of equipment uh, tailored to the needs of games like games consoles, you know, you have to have some hardware. So over the years, this multiplicity uh, of formats has determined various distribution models. 
you know, profiles of recipients, equipment suppliers, uh, some formats are more open than others. At any one time, there are many formats. There are many equipment developers who are fighting for both supply, software suppliers, developers, and distribution markets, consumers. Uh, so as there are many formats, um, you know, these uh, uh, and platforms and distribution methods, this may rely uh, on a more or less strict control of the supplier and distribution market. Um, so uh, regardless of whether, you know, a developer has a, uh, an aggressive stance to control uh, suppliers and distribution networks, we all have one feature, as I previously mentioned, I'm highly aware of the existence and importance of intellectual property rights. After all, without IP rights to the game, the developer cannot say that they have anything. Um, so a best example, I think, uh, to describe these realities is Nintendo, um, which is a both software developer and a hardware man manufacturer. So uh, Nintendo came out with, his, with, with its uh, first video game console in the mid 1980s um, the realities of the market were not really promising at the time. Uh, consumers did not trust products like video game consoles and computer games after the video game crash of 1983, uh, which I won't uh, delve into uh, today. However, I, I strongly recommend that you look it up. It's, it's a fantastic read if you uh, want to go on to, let's say, a Wikipedia page on this or, or a numerous YouTube uh, movies, uh, films on uh, documenting this uh, video game crash. It's, it's, it's a thrilling ride. So even, even though you know, the market was kind of oversaturated and overburdened with uh, uh, very unpleasant uh, experiences of consumers with video games, which were novel at the time, by the way, you know, Nintendo responded to these con uh, concerns firstly by, well, kind of labeling the product as children's toy, uh, you know, with adding like this uh, robot, which you, uh, with the help of which you can kind of play the game with. Uh, it, it was definitely a gimmick. Uh, but either way, they strictly control the quality of software available on the platform. And this is, you know, I can't stress this enough. And that's, uh, that's been a feature of Nintendo uh, ever since. Uh, the emphasis was on titles uh, that were to be exclusive on the Nest platform and the Nintendo Entertainment System platform. They were either created in-house uh, in Nintendo or among a handful of third parties, software developers. Um, but, you know, there were some non-exclusive titles available, you know, but these were subjected to, you know, rigorous testing. Nintendo had and to this day has, has been in charge of what products come, come out on its consoles. More than once, actually, Nintendo forced, you know, changes to games being implemented by developers, conditioning its, uh, its rollout on, on this platform. So in, in these realities, although not quite being uh, aware of this entire business context, I had my uh, first contact with my first video game. It was Solar Striker, a, a very down to earth, you know, shoot em up. Uh, I, I used to play it when I was five years old in 1990 on my first Game Boy. And, you know, I've, been a, I've, I've remained a consumer ever since. You know, at that time, obviously, I was not totally aware of, you know, the format wars. I did not know that, you know, we can play on personal computers, which uh, to, to me then, back then, were, you know, spreadsheet machines, generally. I, I'd never seen a, you know, PC game. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't really aware of any of that uh, stuff. But either way, uh, let's get down to basics. What, what actually is, uh, you know, a computer game? What is a video game? You know, let's try to ponder this, this issue of a definition. Uh, so basically, it's software, that's for sure. You know, it's software that allows interaction for, uh, for entertainment purposes and with a device. Uh, so you have hardware, you have software, and you have an, an interactive entertainment purpose. And that uh, element of interaction is crucial, you know? 
entering a command by the user should should have an impact, even if you know insignificant is significant on uh, um, on a displayed image. And and that image is also important because, as you can uh, see from the next example from 1951, there were kind of computer games which involved software, hardware, and were used for entertainment purposes, and you can interact with that. But there was actually no screen. Um, so that's uh, obviously this is a totally a, a moot point at this point. But uh, you know it's 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 important to consider the history in this. That one of the first computer games was a game of checkers, and this was developed by uh, Christopher Strachey, who uh, developed a program for playing checkers uh, in May 1951. So uh, you know decades ago, um, the game you know, was really uh, burdensome for the computers at the time, which were mainframe, mainframe computers, which, uh, you know, took up floors, entire floors of buildings. Um, so uh, he, uh, when he developed the, 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 the game first, you know, he overburdened his computer, uh, which was made available to him. But, you know, there was Alan Turing uh, with, uh, with whom he had, um, uh, with whom he had been acquainted with before. And, and, and he kind of had access to a much more beefier uh, hardware. So uh, in, in, with his help, with, with help of Alan Turing, uh, he finally developed uh, a program which would enable to play a game of checkers with reasonable speed. By the way, Strachey is, is, is very well known in the video game industry. He continued to work on a programming language, the CPL, which later grew to C, C, and C languages, programming languages, which were, uh, which would be uh, in time instrumental in computer game development in, in, in the later decades. I mean, um, the, the next milestone was the development of, of animation techniques of displays. <clears throat> You know, first of all, they, they, they were, uh, at first they were based on, you know, exotic oscillators and vector graphics. Uh, however, you know, these were limited to monstrously expensive mainframe computers. Uh, the first example, however, of a commercially available computer game was computer space. Um, at that time, it, it also created the first distribution model as a computer station for distribution in, in gaming venues, casinos, bar, pool clubs. You know, these were uh, almost so-called you know, slot machines, slot machines or ar arcade games. It was in 1971. And uh, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney would, were not entirely satisfied with, with the success of computer space. They sold around uh, 1,500 devices. Uh, for a meager profit of one million. So in 1972, uh, Bushnell founded Atari, so which actually is a computer game publishing soft uh, software publishing company right now to this day. Uh, they uh, kind of based and and this is one of the first um, uh, litigations uh, to, uh, within the computer uh, game industry as well. Because uh, you know the the infamous, well, famous at first, Pong uh, became infamous as the uh, as the subject of this litigation. Uh, first and foremost, because you know, with Alan a Acorn, uh, Nolan Bushnell developed Pong. You know, one of the first major commercial successes of games. Um, Atari, well, directly modeled this on on a solution and product available on the market, which was called table tennis. Uh, a game for the first home game console, the Magnavox Odyssey, uh, which was actually developed in uh, earlier in 1976. Um, and, and the thing is that uh, Ralph Baer and Bill Rush uh, actually patented that, uh, that specific uh, use. Um, so in 1971, uh, these two inventors um, uh, signed a deal with Magnavox, which was at the time a, a, a consumer electronics manufacturer for the production of the console. Uh, and in March 1990, uh, 1972, um, uh, the, the console was presented and delivered to, uh, to the public. 
at the same time, it was it was a huge success, but not as huge as the later Pong consoles. Um, and the source of conflict with Atari was obviously that pair of bear patents, uh, one that which described uh, described the uh, well, actually, you can see an animation of, of what, what Pong is, if, if you didn't know that already. It's a fairly uh, um, uh, uncomplicated game, but still, in its simplicity, it's very much addicting. I don't know if you played it any time, but uh, I, I, do, I do actually recommend it. Uh, so this, this was actually, this is a, a, a copy of the Magnavox Odyssey. As you can see, uh, it's very much similar to Pong and its gameplay mechanics. So, and the patent itself, the patents, the two patents described how Odyssey showed player controlled objects or dots on a video monitor and described a range of games that can be played on the system. And an earlier patent would describe in detail how, you know, two dot, dots collide and one of them bounces, uh, especially on example of a ping pong game. So this uh, this this uh, this litigation obviously came came to court. Uh, however, you have to keep in mind that a lot of uh, the early litigation and generally litigation in IP is settled out of court. Um, but either way, this this came up to uh, a judge's ruling, and the judge ruled that Bear's more general Odyssey patent constituted constituted a pioneering patent for the art of video games and found the defendant's games infringing the patents. Uh, in, in turn, uh, they settled earlier. Uh, uh, Magnavox was granted a $1.5 million uh, license fee. And Magnavox uh, gave, them, uh, gave Atari access to all technologies manufactured uh, by them for, for uh, the better part of the next year. Um, so this was more or less the first, what, what is then, uh, what was uh, now, what is now called the first generation of video game consoles. Uh, in the second uh, generation, we see, you know, fragmentation. You know, we see that there are three segments of computer games market being developed. Slot machines or arcade games, you know, which have a high unit and software cost. You know, initially the software was part of the hardware, then huge replaceable cartridges appeared, but there was usually one developer and one machine, you know, the, the format was closed. And it has had a, a limited distribution, you know, to arcades and pool clubs. It had obviously personal computers, which have an average device cost, low software cost. And this hardware was generally produced by a vendor independent of software developers. Um, so it had open standards. This allowed software vendors to release alternative operating systems and software with almost no restrictions. And obviously piracy was rampant. Um, and however, you know, the quality of games was, well, it was all over the place. You know, uh, there was, uh, you know, games journalism was in its infancy. So basically you had uh, a, a very, very di diverse market on PC. And you had open distribution as well. Uh, with games on consoles, usually you have low cost of the console and higher cost of software. It's a model based on shifting the cost to the consumer over a longer period. So consoles generally were and still are sold at or even below the cost of production. Uh, so we had, uh, towards media, you have re removable cartridges, media. And this allowed to produce software for a given console. You had to have a license from the supplier. Uh, and most often to buy blank uh, media so from, the soft, from the manufacturer of the, of the hardware, like with Nintendo. And it's uh, depending on what's, uh, what's the uh, hardware manufacturer's stance on distribution, it can be either open or closed. Uh, and uh, as previously mentioned, uh, the end of this period suffered a collapse uh, in the console market in, in the United States. Uh, Atari in television, which was a, um, a competitor of Atari at the time, did not do much to you know, control the quality of productions released for the consoles. Um, there was also a shortage of trade journalism. You know, consumers did not really know exactly what they were buying into. Uh, often the games were buggy or unfinished. 
uh, publishers wanted to launch the product, you know, uh, at all costs, regardless of quality assurance. Uh, so I, I'll give you a couple of examples towards, you know, what led to the video game crash of 1983. Uh, there were basically two games that, you know, are attributed to uh, delivering such a notorious result. Atari uh, obtained a license to produce a Pac-Man port for its uh, Atari consoles. So it commissioned, you know, 12, 12 million uh, items, uh, cartridges of the game, uh, while there was only 10 million Atari consoles in the entirety of the US. Uh, their logic being that, uh, you know, they hoped that the success of the arcade Pac-Man would increase console sales. Um, and a similar drive um, uh, was, uh, was the basis of Atari's move to rush development for a game licensed from Steven Spielberg's movie E.T., Extraterrestrial. So Atari was a part of Warner Communications at that time. Uh, and the movie came out in 1982. Uh, Warner then urged Atari to, to release the game for Christmas, as I, uh, CD Projekt Red was obviously rushed. Um, with with development of you know uh, bug fixes for uh, for the previously gold achieved uh, cyberpunk game. So, uh, but in that particular instance, uh, the entirety of the game would have to be uh, developed from scratch in six weeks. I mean, I don't know much about you know video game development, you know, and production, but as far as I know, it's it's very little time. So the game was you know it was a critical failure. You know, it was uh, like uh, most AP, HP uh, in gamer ter terms of Atari just went down the drain. Uh, and to this day, it was, it's considered the worst game of all time. Uh, there were so many cartridges uh, produced, around 5 million. Um, almost all of them were returned to a developer. Uh, people were returning them to stores as defective merchandise. Um, and the demand was so low, it was not profitable, profitable even to stock the cartridges. So uh, the majority of them were just simply taken to a desert, uh, to a desert, uh, and buried in New Mexico, almost like you know, in Breaking Bad fashion, you know. Um, and then uh, that year, Atari reported a loss of five hundred thirty-six million dollars uh, by the end of that fiscal year. So it was a huge loss, and you know, bankruptcy was basically in in, in their in their eyes. So it's, it's a lesson for both developers and also for us lawyers, you know, to, to, to have the consumers in mind first and foremost in the industry, you know, stop the impulses and, and business practices that can, you know, alienate consumers from the medium in general. Uh, and when, you know, the market is too fragmented, you know, it, it generally does not look appealing to the consumer. However, of course, some, where some lose, others win. And um, my next example uh, or feature from video game history was the history of Tetris. I think it's a great example to show how convoluted IP acquisition may look like. Um, so it was basically developed in 1984 by Alexei Pajintov. Uh, he was a researcher at the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Uh, so the game quickly gained popularity both in Soviet Russia and in the West. So obviously businessmen quickly began to find out, you know, from whom to buy the rights to the game. Initially, it was thought that the Soviet, Acad Acad the Soviet Academy of Sciences and thus the Soviet Union uh, was to acquire the rights. Uh, so there was a, a publisher, a British publisher, um, Andromeda Software, um, send the fax, they send the fax to the academy uh, with a draft license agreement. Uh, the Soviet Academy of Sciences wasn't really interested. They didn't give much thought to it. Uh, however, uh, Andromeda uh, discovered who actually wrote the game. Uh, so the contract was sent to the authors uh, and, and they agreed, uh, not really signing much, but you know, it was uh, almost a implicit or a tacit license, uh, we might assume. Uh, so on the basis of, you know, this, uh, which I wouldn't imagine would, you know, um, be allowed or uh, uh, be grin lit 
by any IP lawyer within the industry, uh, Andromeda Software quickly began selling licenses for the game's production uh, for distribution in West Western Europe by Mirrorsoft and in the US by Spectrum Holobyte. Uh, and, and then Mirrorsoft you know, started trading uh, and, and uh, Spectrum Holobyte as well. Mirrorsoft sold its Japanese rights to Atari games, uh, to, to its subsidiary Tengen, uh, which then sold the arcades rights to Sega uh, and the console rights to BPS, which uh, is a company which published versions for Japanese computer, including Nintendo family computer, the Famicom, which would later be marketed in the Western world as the Nintendo Entertainment System. And these publishers, uh, you know, kind of wanted first and foremost to revamp uh, the graphics a little bit because, you know, look at it, you know, it doesn't really look appealing. Um, so Andromeda then had only legal title in the form of a fax from Pajinto, the original game creator. And, and at the same time, you know, it was already being sold in 1988 for Amiga, Atari, ZX Spectrum, Commodore PC, Amstrad, CPC, you know, uh, and the game at the time that didn't really indicate Pajintov as a creator. It merely said, you know, it's made in the United States of America, but designed abroad. So um, Robert Stein, the then president of Andromeda Software, you, you know, he knew he had a problem. You know, he had to obtain a better legal title to the game. Uh, he started contacting Pajintov and the center, the Central Soviet Software Export Organization, Elektronork Technika, uh, which was um, uh, established as the party to, to deal with uh, when wanting to distribute software developed within the Soviet Union. And uh, within uh, a couple of months in 1988, he, he secured a 10 year license for current and future systems. At the same time, you know, they, well, they weren't even aware of the fact that that game was, was published at all uh, in the Western world. And now the complication begins, if, 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 if it wasn't complicated enough. Uh, by that time, there were a dozen or so organizations who had some part, or at least they thought so, uh, to the Tetris games that they published. Uh, but Electron or Technica was only aware of the personal computers uh, license that Andromeda had. So uh, at the time, 1988, Spectrum Holobyte uh, sold the Japanese rights to its computer games and arcade machines uh, to uh, Bulletproof Software's Hank Rogers. Rogers at the time was really close to Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi. And, you know, he, and, and, and he, sa he said that, listen, I want to have handheld rights, you know, mobile rights. Um, so Hank Rogers, who acquired the rights to Japan, stuck a deal with, uh, with the launch, struck a deal with the launch of Tetris on the Nintendo handheld console, the Game Boy. And it was, it was a great deal, you know? It was a deal that basically said that each Game Boy would have a, a pack in game of Tetris. So each Game Boy produced equaled one copy of Tetris sold. So Rogers was in a conundrum. He wanted to uh, get the rights. He, they, he went to Andromeda and Robert Stein said, yeah, he wanted to uh, kind of consult things a little bit with Electronic Technica. So, uh, you know, Rogers, you know, being the, sh the shrewd businessman that he obviously was, you know, he was sensing a problem. So he went to Moscow the next day and it turned out that he appeared in the office of Electronic Technica the same day as Stein president of Andromeda and yet another publisher, Mirisop. You know, everybody, you know, wanting to uh, get a license from for, for Tetris. Um, Rogers in the end quickly obtained rights to Tetris for, for mobile games and then presented the director of the Institute with, with, with the finished cartridge. So it was very much, you know, the Wild West, if you, if you will, uh, a, a video game uh, a IP. Uh, so Electronor Technica began, began accusing Nintendo of copyright infringement, but, you know, Rogers assured that, you know, they had obtained it from Tengen, you know, who obtained them from Mirisoft, and, you know, Mirisoft is over there, so uh, why would you, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, throw around these, uh, these accusations? 
so during this time, Rogers befriended Pajintov over a game of Go, and and P Pajintov would support Rogers, you know, throughout this these discussions, and and, and later he he came to secure the Tetris rights for for Mirza. Um So uh, and by the way, uh, the uh, the director of that institute. Uh, proposed to Rogers that Stein's Andromeda software's license would be canceled and Nintendo would be granted the game rights for both home and handheld consoles. Ultimately, you know, Nintendo won this caricature of a tender. Um, so there was a deal with Nintendo for 500,000 US dollars and 25 cents each, per each cartridge. Of course, you know, Pajintov didn't see a cent out of this deal, unfortunately. But meanwhile, Atari started selling Tetris on the NES through its subsidiary Tengen. Um, in March 1988, uh, 1989, uh, Nintendo called on Atari to stop producing the NES version of Tetris. Uh, Atari, you know, kind of contacted Microsoft saying to them, listen, we got that license from, from you guys. And they assured that, you know, we, we were in, in, in the green, you know, we had rights. Uh, of course, Nintendo hold the, held the ground and, and, and obviously it ended up in the litigation and Atari games tried to prove that NES was a computer uh, because they had, uh, you know, a rights for compute, personal computers. And they argued that Famicom, it's, it's, for, it's short for family computer and thus the Nintendo Entertainment System should be considered a personal computer of sorts. Um, the main argument was uh, unfortunately to Atari rejected. <clears throat> uh, and actually Pajintov testified. Uh, Pajintov stressed that the original contract was only for computers and not other machines. Uh, and for its part, Nintendo also called on the director of the Soviet Institute to testify on its behalf. And, it, and the then presiding judge stated that Microsoft and Spectrum Holobyte never had explicit approval to sell Tetris on consoles and ruled in favor of Nintendo. Uh, the, whole, the whole shenanigans ending up in Pajinto finally moving to the US where, where he started working for Spectrum Holobyte. Uh, and this case, case which, I, which I adore, uh, shows how claims, you know, uh, should not be trusted, you know, um, and due diligence should be done, you know, preferably, preferably by uh, sourcing rights from developers. Um, I'd also, also like to talk about um, uh, a, few, a few items, uh, another, another case from the 1980s. Uh, Nintendo versus Blockbuster, you know, and this is more connected to video game distribution more than the, the, the case before. And in, in 1984, uh, uh, the Recording Industry Association of Japan successfully implemented the rental right. I mean, the right of lending into Japanese copyright law before it doesn't, didn't really exist. It allowed makers of a product of a brand to specifically allocate how their product would be produced uh, reproduced or used by rental stores or, or services uh, and implementing their own terms and conditions. Uh, and Nintendo, uh, in line with this law, said you know, they did not allow for any rental stores in Japan to rent their products. In America, however, uh, renting video games was considered differently as the copyright law of the United States did not have a clause specific to video game rentals. I mean, the music industry was protected uh, and music rentals were completely banned. Uh, video televisions and movies had created an extremely successful rental business with avenue, uh, annual revenue over $5 billion in 1988, surpassing the, bo the box office revenue at that year of 4.5 billion. So video game rental stores had huge leverage and it was a, there was a huge lobby you know, uh, so they uh, they kind of created you know rental sections to rent out software uh, software titles, um, and and obviously Nintendo, uh, uh, which I, I think you might imagine already, didn't like this at all. Uh, Howard Lincoln, who was by the way uh, in-house counsel of Nintendo at that time and later um, uh, served as uh, general manager. 
uh, said that uh, video game rental is nothing but commercial rape. Verbatim. So from, but obviously from a consumer perspective, there were many advantages to running a video game uh, or its software, you know, the environment in while um, getting a whole copy. Uh, and you, you would, you know, have the opportunity to try it out. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in the, the US, they did not have the rights to control uh, the rental of software. Um, but uh, Nintendo noted that, you know, a blockbuster photocopied game manuals, you know, because of the people who rented games often misappropriated this man these manuals. Thus, they filed suit accusing blockbuster of uh, possessing photocopies of game instructions. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the computer software industry, you know, they sought to gain protection with, with, an, uh, with an act. Uh, in theory, the, the bill was to cover uh, video games software as well, but there was uh, another lobbying group like, uh, called the Video Software Dealers Association, which lobbied to exclude video games from the final draft. So it was finally determined to leave uh, video games out of the bill. Uh, and, and thus, um, it was believed that, you know, Nintendo would have too much of a market, you know, uh, as it was extremely dif difficult to copy or produce uh, software on computer car on, on Nintendo cartridges, unlike, you know, normal computer software is easy to replicate. So uh, Blockbuster filed court, court papers uh, in line with Nintendo's earlier request to stop copying of manuals and request and release a statement saying that, you know, it had uh, contacted uh, Blockbuster uh, and, and Nintendo contacted Blockbuster to uh, to stop copying the manuals. Uh, and finally, both copies settled settled the case out of court for an undisclosed amount. Um, and in 1990, a revision of the Computer Software Rental Amendments Act, the House and Senate voted in favor of Blockbuster and agreed that video game rental would be widely permitted. Uh, so out of this uh, slide, as you can see, there's also an already obsolete but very interesting caveat in, in video game history, uh, shareware. I mean, shareware is a type of software that is initially provided free of charge to users who are allowed to and are encouraged to make and share copies of the program, hence shareware. Uh, so shareware is often, you know, was offered for, for download or was included in the form of a floppy disk, you know, the time where discs were actually floppy. Uh, or a compact disc, which came with a magazine. So this type of distribution gained popularity in the 1980s, 1990s, especially among you know personal computer users, which you know had the freedom of you know copying freely uh, things that uh, could be copied on a floppy drive. Uh, many games were released in this way, like Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, Jazz Jack Rabbit, and as a rule, several levels were made available. And once you complete a game or quit the game, there was a message with ordering information on how to get the rest of the game. So this actually worked surprisingly well at the time. And for developers such as id Software, Raven Software, and Epic Mega Games, it was you know a breath of fresh air because they weren't bound to you know big main publishers and their and their you know overinflated marketing budgets. So in, in that time as well, you know, we had what, what was later called or, or even there then coined the console wars. You know, although a lot of time and culture of video games was, was, it was devoted to format wars, it's worth noticing that and mentioning that in the era of the early 1990s, there was a fierce struggle between competitors and in term of, you know, very aggressive Marketing, marketing campaigns, interesting from a European perspective, because they were often based on comparative advertising, uh, playing on, you know, very sensitive and subjective notes, like referring to feelings of other players, you know, like Genesis does with what Nintendo don't. I mean, totally unacceptable, at least from, you know, a comparative advertisement standpoint over here in Poland, at least. And 
as well, uh, in the 1990s, there was also a very interesting development of how Nintendo's militant stance actually um, kind of acted to the benefit of its now biggest competitor. And, 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 and uh, possibly it can be said that it's, it's the biggest name in, in, in the current video game console market, meaning Sony PlayStation. So uh, as you have seen, you know, Nintendo does not beat around the bush when it comes, comes to fiercely controlling its IP and interests. I mean, let's just look at, uh, look at the case how, you know, actually brought up a competitor. So in, in late development of the Super NES, the, the, um, uh, the next console after the NES console, uh, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, they developed uh, the Super NES CD platform as an add-on in collaboration with Sony. So this platform was to be launched as an add-on with the stand and as a standard NES, which would be a Sony hybrid console called the PlayStation. So in the 1980s, uh, Sony, uh, Sony and Nintendo have had a fruitful relationship for uh, de and Sony developed their um, uh, uh, Nintendo's audio chip that would work with the SNES. Uh, the success of this project prompted Nintendo to partner up with Sony and develop both a CD-ROM expansion for the SNES and, and a Sony branded console which would play both Super NES cartridges and the titles released for the new Super Disc format. So uh, development began in the in 1988, with uh, when Nintendo signed an agreement with Sony to produce a CD-ROM expansion. So under the agreement, Sony was to develop and maintain control of the Super Disc format, with uh, software licensing rights being trust transferred to Sony. In addition, Sony would be the only beneficiary of the music and and mu movie software licenses licenses it aggressively pursued as the add-on functionality you know, uh, of the CD-ROM had merit in, 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 in distribution of newer titles. So Nintendo president was you know, kind of wary of Sony being, first of all, the only supplier of the audio chip used by the SNES and, and all of these exclusivity rights that Sony had acquired from Nintendo. So to offset this, this deal, Yamauchi uh, sent uh, Nintendo of America president Minoru Arakawa and uh, executive director Howard Lincoln again, Howard Lincoln, a, a, a household name <laughs> to me at least, uh, to Europe to negotiate a more favorable deal with Philips, a rival to Sony's CD business. So we're, there was this uh, interesting uh, turnout uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show in June 1991, when Sony announced the PlayStation, a CD-compatible console slash accessory. Next day, at the same show, Nintendo unveiled a partnership with Philips at that show, as surprise to all audiences, including Sony. So obviously, they had a little bit of a falling out. Uh, and despite the fact that Sony has, has had produced a number of prototypes of this Nintendo PlayStation, which by the way, now are, you know, a rare collectible item in their own right, reaching, you know, whopping $300,000 on auctions. You know, the two organizations had never cleared the bad blood between them. But by, by the following year, Sony dropped the further, further development of the Super NES CD-ROM add-on and instead, focused on developing its own console uh, for the next generation of console, consoles which had become known as the PlayStation. And the rest is history. So we had uh, new models uh, also being developed in the late 1990s and the beginning of 21st century with development and more available. Mobile games are a huge business. You know, it's as big a business as so-called traditional games, even more so now during the pandemic. On the other hand, distribution of on, on physical carriers is almost obsolete. You know, nowadays physical carriers printed are usually bought for their collector's value. 
You know, it's about 10% of the total distribution of content. And uh, everything else is done via remote distribution sites like Steam, Epic Game Store, Good Old Games, Apple's App Store, Google Play. So this a question arises, uh, whether, you know, a user who purchases a game in digital form actually has the same rights as in the physical form, a copy. And we're going to focus on that in a minute or two. However, in order to do that, we have to first uh, consider what rights uh, are in a video game in the first place. So if you saw, if you attended uh, the Queen Mary University of London uh, lecture on Monday, you can skip this, you know, you can go make yourself a cup of tea. But generally, I, I hope I'll, I'll, I'll put in some, uh, some interesting examples uh, in this context. So let's start with, you know, the subjects, the, the people who, who actually uh, have these rights from the get-go. Uh, you know, primarily copyrights and, 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 and IP rights in general uh, are subjective. They're, they're an object of, of trade. At the same time, you know, it has uh, these rights usually uh, are conferred onto a physical, a natural person. So uh, they can be shared and disposed of, you know, transferred and licensed to third parties, which would be, you know, secondary right holders. Um, so out of these exclusivity, out of these exclusive intellectual property rights, especially the most important ones, you know, copyrights arise at, at the time of establishing. And that's one important aspect of it. Uh, in the USA, there's an initial requirement from what I gather from literature and colleagues uh, is that there's another additional requirement to establish it on a durable medium. But either way, it's a manifestation of creative activity of, of an individual nature established in any form, regardless of value, purpose, manner of, or expression. So we have very few uh, conditions that have to be met for a product of you know, human intellect to be protected by copyright. So copyright protection is available to authors, creators of works, and that work is basically every manifestation of creative uh, activity with an individual character. So there's this condition of creativity. Uh, it has to be the process of human determination of, 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 human, of a human creative na nature. So it's, it's a subjective condition, you know? Uh, the creator must be internally kind of subjectively convinced that he is creating something individual. So it's, it's not to be equated with uh, the novelty requirement. So that from like patent law, where it, it has to be new. Uh, so this is kind of different. Um, and moreover, the work must have what is so-called a an individual stamp or influence of a creator. It conveys some part of his soul, you know, some part of his creative identity. So we, we, we might say that, you know, copyright is probably the most romantic uh, area of law. And the second condition is that um, the, that manifestation of creative activity has to be established or as US lawyers would say, uh, fixed in any form. Uh, so only the expression may be pr uh, protected, you know, any ideas, procedures, methods, or principles would not be protected, you know, and a, 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 the more technical requirements there are affecting the content of the work, uh, the less creative it is, by the way. Uh, so uh, knowing, you know, what kind of formalities, by the way, none, must be met, uh, because there's no, you know, like copyright office that that would uh, require uh, registration first for these rights to be established. So now we might kind of consider what kind of elements of a game may be treated as copyrightable works. So we have texts, first and foremost, first and foremost. You know, obviously the texts that we lawyers uh, are accustomed with like contracts, declarations of will, usually, you know, uh, they're usually written in a strict language, uh, using legal and legalese language. So there's very, very little scope for uh, this uh, artist's individual identity. But at the same time, literary texts, scripts, scenarios, dialogues, adaptations, blog entries, website entries, you know, most likely are uh, works in each case. 
just like computer programs. I mean, computer programs, uh, this might not be very much intuitive, but they are protected as literary works because of you know some international treaty conundrum. Um, so source code and object code separately, by the way. So uh, it, it is important that uh, copyright protects the way how the code is expressed, not exactly the functions it's themselves, you know? So not the idea underlying how these functions are structured in code, but how it, they are expressed. So it, it does uh, take a little bit of mental gymnastics to grasp this idea, but either way, it's, it's important to remember that basically code is copyrightable. So we have also documentation of computer programs. And that usually kind of depends, depending on how technical requirements, you know, uh, have, have leverage on, uh, on that documentation. However, it's, it's safe to say that they are copyrightable as well. So we have, um, you know, uh, photos, graphics, photographs, uh, they would be considered copyrightable. I mean, for, for one, photography might not be intuitive, uh, but it is very much uh, often in the video game industry, like in the 1990s, techniques were used to, uh, uh, to develop and create two dimensional objects by photographing people or sculptures uh, for a specific 3D scan. Here you can see a, an example of sculpture, sculpture used by uh, the creator, creators of the original Dune, uh, like the uh, Cyber, I don't know, it's a cyber spider. I don't remember. I played Doom so long ago. Sorry, apologies for any Doom nerds out there. Uh, but obviously, you have also some sprites being photographed for the purposes of uh, Prince of Persia, actually. I don't know if you played uh, Prince of Persia much during your childhood years, but, but yeah, these are actual sprites from a video uh, footage uh, taken by the developers. So, uh, it, photography nowadays is also used for other techniques, for example, in photogrammetry. It's a technique that, you know, reproduces the, the shapes, shot sizes, and mutual positions of objects uh, in the field on the basis of photogrammetry. Um, so usually it's, it's generally uses large format photogrammetry cameras and with special aberration free lenses. Uh, and, and drones often are also used for these purposes. In a way, um, you know, highly realistic objects in the background can be obtained fairly easily. And uh, for example, this technique was used by many games, uh, in, in many games, for example, uh, the vanishing of Ethan Carter. So um, coming down to uh, uh, the list of the types of works, you know, the act on copyright in Poland at least, also uh, directly mentions architectural works. So uh, let's ponder this for a second, you know, whether architectural works are within a game. I mean, uh, at least in Poland, uh, the doctrine itself says that, you know, not architectural work is, and it's a design basically, it's, it's a design of architecture uh, or urban um, uh, or, or urban urban sciences in a design that it's and includes a layout and spatial arrangement of objects uh, or elements of objective reality. So in that sense, uh, you know, you don't have to be an architect to uh, design to, to be creator of an architectural design. Um, however, you know, whether to consider a 3D building object as an architectural work, I mean, that might be troublesome, you know? Uh, and I think that the dividing element over here uh, is, in, in the case of computer games, is definitely the layout of elements of in objective reality. I mean, uh, it, it seems that three-dimensional objects in games could not necessarily be, be reflected in objective reality, such as, you know, I don't know, platforms hanging in the air in Super Mario, or objects from you know the Zen world in Half Life, you know I think that uh, these wouldn't wouldn't be considered architectural works. It also has to be remembered that you know three dimensional objects in computer games are most often just a facade. They serve as an illusion of stability. They are they use the bending of laws of physics. In fact, the, the buildings in games are mostly you know empty husks. 
now that no no one designs you know brackets beams or construction walls in a the game they can only be observed you know these in internal workings can be observed when you know uh, the game glitches you know uh, the most common glitch of clipping when you clip through the wall or the, or the floor uh, that is when your hero falls through the ground or it like uh, vanishes through a wall you can see that it's basically a a husk a, a facade so what about other works uh, you have stage or choreographic or pantomime works sure i mean definitely you can argue that these are uh are of uh, great importance i mean one of the uh one of the most um actually this is from the last slide uh prince of persia actually that's that's one of uh a a prime example of use of uh, choreographic works uh, so obviously right now 3D techniques are used with actors wearing, you know, special suits that record movements and allow other imaging devices to record body movements. Uh, and these are recorded as skeletal movements or muscles uh, of characters in the game. And this also applies to facial muscles. Um, of course, it, it won't always be a copyrightable work like performing simple movements like lifting a mug or uh, representing of, of a walking human being, uh, it would, would not be an expression of creative activity. However, any movement of an, an imaginary figure, such like uh, an alien from Alien, uh, or a complex, you know, human movement, you know, sequences while dancing or fencing, uh, can certainly be considered as, you know, choreographic artworks. Uh, by this way, uh, you know. At the same time, you're establishing that word and performing an artistic performance of that specific word, which is also, which will be mentioned in a few minutes, a separate right from copyrights. And you have also, you know, videos and audiovisual works, uh, which obviously, and audio works, which obviously unequivocally uh, are, are copyrightable. There are basic elements of what we consider now as games. Uh, copyrights, I mean, games also uh, contain images and likenesses. And obviously, you have, you know, Keanu Reeves' uh, image and likeness. So I, I would assume, and I'm more positive than not, that CD Projekt Red attained a robust uh, license and permission to disseminate uh, Keanu Reeves' license in this game and any paraphernalia and other, other rights that might be associated with the game. Uh, you have also derivative rights, which are uber important. You know, uh, we should always think of remasters, remakes, sequels, prequels, you know, ports to other hardware of a game. Uh, you have correspondence protection as well. I mean, this is like, uh, you know, kind of offbeat, you know, I don't know such an example of such rights being used in the video game industry, but certainly at some point there will be such a game. Uh, you have artistic performances, as mentioned. When, whenever you have actors or, you know, mocap players, uh, actors being uh, scanned with, into the game, you know, you have uh, a risk of dealing with artistic performances. You have phonograms and videograms, which are kind of related rights. Specifically, they are related rights, uh, and they're related to artistic performances <clears throat> in a sense that they are first recordings of these artistic performances. I mean, you have broadcast rights as well. These are important related rights and obviously important for streaming platforms, such as Twitch. Uh, other rights, uh, I'll, I'll get to them maybe later on, but what is important are, you know, and currently, one of the most important rights in the video game industry are, you know, trade secrets. Uh, publishers and producers obtain great amounts of data about their users because for years, online game publishers have been, you know, studying the telemetry of, 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 of telemetry data of players. You know, what are they, their playing styles? How much time do they spend? At what times? What items they buy? So this um, accumulates to a, a huge amount of data which is used to polish games, virtual items, to curate matches, to model demand and supply, 
to match players in, in, in rooms, all of it basically enabling to um, moderate and, and uh, kind of make, make business make more sense. And, and obviously this data is strictly protected. Publishers do not give this data access to anyone. Um, and, and know-how and business secrets are essentially the same, uh, but basically you have to remember <clears throat> uh, one important aspect because this, this trade secret uh, definition encompasses a vast array of, of, of items of any, basically any information which has economic value. However, one, uh, one important uh, condition has to be met that the entrepreneur uh, entitled to use that information with due diligence has taken action to keep it confidential. So in a sense that, you know, it, uh, the entrepreneur has the will to keep, to keep that information secret and that must be recognizable. Uh, so in a sense, uh, this, is, this is important to consider as, as these, uh, uh, these, uh, these trade secrets right, rights are, are very much important and, and video game publishers especially very much rely on that. Uh, it should be also remembered in this context that industrial property rights such as patents, trademarks, industrial designs you know, are published uh, together with the application. So it becomes public. So ipso facto, you can't have both. You can't have a trade secret and have a patent. At the same time, this data uh, can be structured. And when it is structured within a database, it moreover, more often than not, is protected by uh, specific database rights. So these are rights, IP rights, different and separate from copyrights, for example. Um, but still, you know, you, you know, we now see that you know, data can be treated as trade secret, as individual data. The data uh, database uh, can be treated as a copyrightable work, by the way. And uh, data collections by themselves can be protected separately from copyrightable works as database rights. So, uh, what it all means to us, you know, first of all, it means awareness. You know, at some point, it's worth stopping and considering what we can do. Um, um, first of all, you know, we have to protect to what we collect, uh, enable uh, to be able to be able to be uh, to monetize it further, uh, and not to get involved in any infringement of someone's IP. And the computer games industry likes to monetize data. Uh, a flagship example of this is an invention Activision Publishing applied for a patent in 2017, which relies on a system and method for managing microtransactions in a multiplayer video game, among other by matching younger players, noobs, with experts, expert players, uh, to encourage less skilled players to buy items in the game via microtransactions. So, I mean, developers, of course, do this. Uh, we just don't see it. We, we, as gamers, often do not consider this. Uh, but Activision, you know, um, got the flack of being one of the few which has chosen to speak about it publicly by filing, filing its solution to be treated uh, as, as patent protected. So patent protection, by the way, is also very important. Let's face it, the largest computer games market is in the US, where patent protection for technical programming solutions used in, in games function, functions very well. Uh, and there are many examples, especially in the beginning of the industry, which I mentioned, because, you know, everything back then was new and not obvious. Um, and what is happening in the United US affects the global game industry. For example, the uh, 1998 Namco patent serves a good example. I mean, the first Sony PlayStation introduced in 1984, uh, you know, its capabilities were impressive, but it had one big drawback. It replaced the previous generation game cartridges with CD-ROMs. So after starting the PlayStation game, you had to wait for the console to boot the game from the disc uh, into its own memories, uh, into its own memory. And it, you know, it took a lot of time, you know? So watching the loading screen was boring. So uh, Namco kind of wanted to solve this problem by including another simpler game uh, during the loading screen. 
So in 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 their game Ridge Racer for the original uh, PlayStation, you could play uh, Galaxian, you know, Namco's uh, 1980s arcade game. Um, so obviously it it did have merit. So, but still, you know, these patents ca caused a lot of controversy. You know, Activision due to uh, concerns about privacy violations and profiling in a broad sense. Uh, and Namco, due to the fact that the solution uh, of the game and game seemed obvious to, to some gamers. And, 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 and therefore, you know, we should always consider uh, patents in, in games as well. What about trademarks? I mean, I mean, of course, you know, you can't stress this enough. Uh, trademarks are very important. They allow to distinguish the services or goods of an entrepreneur from uh, goods or services of another entrepreneur. And a lot of uh, game assets can be protected, you know, a title, subtitle, characters, logotypes, items, location items, game events. Uh, and there's also, you know, third party rights as well. I mean, there might be situations such as in a, in a film or a book uh, or other creative medium that you would need to use a third party trademark, you know, like uh, when a character gets into a Ferrari, drive and empties the magazine of his rifle with uh, Smith and Wesson. Um, so why don't we see this type of situations? You know, well, first of all, because of the nature of IP rights and global nature of the market, you know, uh, IP rights are definitely national uh, and games come out globally. Therefore, uh, if you see a third party trademark in a computer game, it's uh, almost certain that it, it, it was followed by a license agreement. However, uh, what if the use of a trademark is only incidental and, and, and does not scope, uh, fall within the scope of trademark use? Like uh, for the purposes, that is for the purposes of distinguishing goods from other goods. Um, in theory, there should be no problem, but let, let's look at the standards in the US. Actually, there's this important case law, which I would want to mention. Uh, it's called the, the Rogers case. I won't delve into uh, the specifics, uh, I would refer you to, you know, uh, Googling the Rogers test, which basically um, uh, came about from a, a case of, of Ginger Rogers, the, the actor portrayed on this slide, which su who sued uh, Alberto Gribaldi and MGM for producing and distributing uh, a, a Fellini's 1986 film, Ginger and Fred, uh, which kind of suggested that it's a film uh, adapting Ginger Rogers' affair or uh, relationship with Fred Astaire, with Ginger Rogers being uh, a movie star back in the 1930s and 40s. So the court confirmed that, you know, uh, there would be no question of trademark infringement when um, uh, an ambiguous title of a movie uh, would excessively uh, restrict freedom of expression. So there were three actual aspects to Rogers' test, you know? So the defendant would show that the title of a work uh, has some artistic relevance to the work, and that title is not clearly misleading as to the source or content of the work, and uh, the test could only be applied to a non-commercial use of, of the mark. So this test sort of stands to this day. And one of the uh, quite recent actual applications of this test uh, from March 2020 was when Activision, the publisher of the Call of Duty series of games, a typical shooter set in a military climate, included in the game a car which was, well, strikingly similar to the Humvee produced by AM General. So on the left, you see the Humvee, and on the right, you see the uh, car from, from the game. Uh, the court considered, you know, whether use of the alleged AM general trademarks was uh, of artistic importance to, to the games. Uh, the court generally ruled that there should be no dispute in this regard. Uh, if realism is an artistic goal, the presence of real military vehicles in modern war games undoubtedly supports this goal. So uh, definitely uh, the court found that use of the Humvee was motivated by an artistic choice, the desire to, to realistically portray an armed conflict. 
rather by, than by a choice dictated by a desire to earn more money just for the sake of it. So um, listen, guys, I, I, I still have a couple, well, in the teens of minutes, uh, but I, I would like to uh, share with you uh, at least uh, a couple of provisions, at least, of a uh, development agreement. Um, and, and this is from an actual agreement for development services. I mean, the, the, the actual names of the parties were obviously blanked out. Uh, so we have the main developer and the Polish company, which was a, sub, let's say, sub-developer. So we have kind of a sort of a list of exhibits, um, which are fairly standard. Uh, we have um, some uh, some uh, some important definitions, which also outline what is important. You know, first of which is an annex to the contract of employment, uh, and which is obviously very important to the, the publisher, to the producer. You know, as we know, acquisition of IP is crucial. Doubts surrounding acquisition of, you know, the most extensive possible rights can be a headache. So for um, international publishers, you know, the specificity of, uh, of local law is very much important, uh, you know, with regard to uh, derivative rights, personal rights, because, you know, they're, they're not covered by automatic transfer on the basis of law. Um, so in Poland, if we, for example, if we do not introduce related, uh, you know, detailed regulations to the employment contract, you know, for example, derivative rights will not be transferred onto the employer, and that employer would not be able to transfer them further on to a publisher. So we have assets as well. Uh, no less important, it should be general and contain the legal list of most important assets by nature, which are created on the basis of, of an order. I mean, uh, uh, from what I gather, this, uh, this is more or less a framework for agreement. So there are orders. Uh, you have change of control. I mean, it's a very important issue, especially uh, if the contract is like this one and a framework contract for several projects. You know, uh, the consequences of this, well, Obviously, this will be flagged in due diligence reports. Uh, but uh, even so, it's important that the uh, publisher does not have, does not, is, isn't put in a situation where uh, their uh, competitor uh, acquires rights to the, the game that they publish or develop. Uh, so uh, the contract also assumes uh, that um, a large portion of the materials will be made available by the main uh, to the main developer in this in this studio in Poland. I mean, interestingly enough, this is based on the loan. Uh, I mean, there's materials on uh, on an engine, uh, other information controlled, you know, source code, object code, game builds, uh, assets. Uh, and, and this is all based on a loan agreement, but it's the, the loan agreement, as you will see further on, relates mainly to physical materials, not to licenses. Um, so uh, in that sense, uh, let's, let's go further. You know, uh, work, obviously we have a work description. Uh, so what is actually to be done by uh, the local developer? And finally, we have uh, the preamble uh, sort of uh, the initial uh, provisions of the agreement. So obviously, they they don't want to have control. I mean, uh, over. I mean, the, the main publisher does not want to have strict control over the the developer. However, um, it, it's it, this agreement shows very close cooperation. Um, so, uh, for example, if uh, if some uh, some employee of the Polish studio would not be able to provide services from for some reason, you know, the Polish studio is is to get get a replacement quite quickly, uh, and these are to be uh, employers, uh, but at the same time, not to be these are not to be considered as employees of main dev of, of the main developer. So, at the same time. Um, this uh, this is this is quite important. Um, so uh, consultants are uh, specifically 
uh, selected by main dev, main dev based on their experience and presumed capability. Uh, and these consultancy services and thus consultants may not be provided to anybody else. Um, and at the same time, they want to, uh, you know, control what, what these developers do, what these consultants do. Um, they are to remain loyal. And at the same time, if, if, they, if the main dev doesn't really like them, you know, there are, they are to be uh, replaced. Um, and, and then we have what is um, considered um, also important. Uh, and, and, and this, is re this relates to the crunch culture of, of, of the video game industry. Whereas uh, each consultant shall provide at least uh, for let's say 40 hours per week excluding lunch breaks and reasonable overtime must be expected and main dev shall not pay for such overtime nor shall consultants be entitled to time off in lieu of overtime payment. So the, bur the burden of any overtime will be borne by the uh, Polish developer. Um, and obviously, two on one is also very important that uh, that it limits uh, the possibility of these consultants to work for any other purposes. Um, general liability insurance, that's, you know, uh, that's a given. Um, we have also uh, 2.22, uh, which is kind of strange, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have this if, if, if I would be the lawyer uh, advising on this contract. Uh, so main dev uh, has the day-to-day -day managerial right and power to direct how work is done uh, in respect to the consultants, which is, I don't know, kind of risky in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, employment relationships. Um, so we have some training, which is not really that important, you know, regular meetings, yeah, um, meetings as well. Um, well, yeah, I was, and this is kind of interesting as well that, uh, you know, that how the works, uh, how the results of the work of the consultants are handed over. I mean, there's a, a, a Perforce server. Perforce is, is a manufacturer of of, of equipment used very much often by the video game industry. And, and, and while downloading onto the server, you know, the, the, the developer uh, is to take reasonable precautions that uh, this integration with the, the, the build does not affect designated uh, uh, branch or, or the, the build adversely. Uh, and you know, taking precautions to ensure that the integration does not break the bill, which is very much important. I mean, backing up individual builds is safe, but not always feasible. I mean, games before optimization are very big, very huge. So this is important. Uh, so we have, you know, providing access to materials. Um, we have uh, loaning the pro proxy server. Uh, we have a license for Morphine, which is now an obsolete animation software license. Um, obviously, Bonnie Rabbit, the Polish perf uh, performing developer, is to continue to be the employer. Um, any, if any consultant terminates, you know, they have to be immediately informed. And, and then there's a specific procedure to, to show what happens. Um, and obviously they cannot use any subcontractors without um, prior written approval of main dev. If you have creative, uh, creation of assets, of course, um, you have um, uh, basically an, a, a procedure for changing uh, the assets which were already created, uh, remuneration, which is very much important, obviously the key point in any negotiation. Uh, and this is a fairly, uh, fairly standard uh, agreement, uh, almost work for hire, basically they'll pay remuneration and that's it uh, per, per consultant per full month. Um, 
fee is calculated on a time, time and materials basis. Yeah, sure. Um, and and the, the gist, um, we have, first of all, granting of a limited non-transferable, non-sublicensable, non-exclusive license to use materials, which is very much important to the Polish development. Um, whereas MADEF acquires ownership, obviously, to all results. Um, and obviously, uh, as mentioned before, they have control of uh, how the employment relationship IP acquisitions look like. Um, and this is also kind of interesting uh, uh, to see that the Polish developer uh, acquire a right to, uh, well, to demand uh, dissemination of this content without, within five years. So actually, this is a sort of a publishing agreement, hence the, the, the name DevPub, Development and Publishing Agreement. And, and if MainDev has not commenced its exploitation with five years from receipt of these results, then basically they, they can terminate, uh, which is kind of interesting because on, on the Polish developers side, you know, uh, the rights have already been conferred. So they would only have a right to, uh, to demand uh, uh, these IP rights that they come back to, uh, to, the, develop, uh, to the Polish developer. So this is interesting. Uh, they may, if they wouldn't, you know, publish and, and the Polish developer would want to raise such claims, you know, it, it's understandable that it may be that uh, they would want to withdraw from the uh, contract with an effect for, for the past. So we got uh, the gist of, you know, obviously warranties, representations, you know, that, you know, uh, assignment of rights is not prevented that you know everything will be fine and dandy uh consultants you know are bound by valid written contracts of employment uh that they have licenses uh that they'll deliver results free and clear of any liens any uh, encumbrances um yeah and that they will not create derivative works of the results and uh, indemnification, liquidated damages. This is fairly standard, standard fare. Some um, liquidated damages as well. Um, but again, confidentiality is, is very much important. And very much often you see uh, very robust uh, provisions on this, especially with, uh, with, with publisher, publishers uh, and developers being wary of giving out their source code uh, in 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 fear of you know this this information being leaked. So uh, more often than not, and there are audits audit rights. There are uh, pre license audits as well. So they want to make sure that cybersecurity is done perfectly well before they uh, the the IP holder confers uh, the materials to the, uh, let's say, sub-developer. Termination, obviously, um, failure to pay. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and obviously, and change of control of the Polish developer. So that's why we had change of control defined earlier. Uh, and the governing law, uh, kingdom of excellence. Yeah, this is the most important part, basically, something that which lawyer lawyers should start from the beginning. And, uh, and that's basically it. Listen, guys, I know that on the chat, um, we have a lot of questions. Maybe I'll uh, take a chance to answer some of them. Uh, uh, gaming exhibitions are not as wild as, no, they're not, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, there was a risk under employment law, definitely. Results, final build of software. Well, um, yeah, sure. Obviously, uh, if if we if we have a, an agreement where we have would have, uh, you know, uh, conferring of rights, usually that uh, I mean, usually sometimes it does happen uh, uh, only upon uh, a formal acceptance of results. However, uh, you know, from an IP acquirer perspective, it's, 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 more, uh, it's definitely more beneficial to see a 
uh, a situation where we would have um, a, a, an earlier uh, IP acquisition. I mean, I'm sorry, guys, I still had quite a bit of materials, uh, especially maybe I'll touch upon one important aspect, aspect I think very much um, uh, interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, you can look these cases up. Uh, first of all, uh, Nintendo Wii case from the CGU uh, from 2012, a great case on uh, use of, 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 of consoles, basically, what can you do with consoles and, and the distinguishing factor between uh, computer games as computer software and audiovisual works, basically, because there's different rules applying to both. You also have uh, Usoft, a, a hugely important case for uh, secondary uh, monetization of, of licenses, uh, but this is strictly for computer programs. And finally, this is something I would want to talk about uh, more, even though, apologies, I kind of uh, overlapped uh, and um, overreached our, uh, my, my welcome. Uh, in, in your valuable time during this evening. However, if you still have a couple of minutes, I'd like to focus on Tom Cabinet, a fairly recent case, basically uh, stating, uh, stating on the aspect of whether or not you can have a secondary market for online distribution of copyrightable works. So, in, in December of 99, 9, uh, 2019, uh, the Court of Justice looked at the issue of exhaustion. Uh, the issue of exhaustion being the, what, what's called in the common law sense, the doctrine of first sale, meaning that if you sell a book, you know you, the IP holder does not have control on, of how uh, the book is, is circulated or marketed after the first initial sale. So Tom Cabinet was a company, unfortunately already was a company, incorporated under Netherlands law, which has introduced an internet service in the form of a virtual market for uh, used eBooks. So the question raised by the court is whether the supply of an electronic book by download for permanent use constitutes a distribution act uh, within the meaning of article four, uh, section one, whether it's uh, an act of making something available, making a work available to the public. Uh, so the essence, uh, what they considered uh, is because, uh, why it's important, because disseminating to the public uh, means that there's basically no exhaustion. However, it, uh, introducing into the market, there is a possible right of exhaustion. So that's the important difference. And getting to the point of, 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 of the matter uh, is that, well, by downloading permanent use of an ebook is covered by a concept of communication to the public. And therefore, uh, you know, not making available to the public in that sense, you know, public, uh, a, a digital distribution of a work does not allow the purchaser, the, uh, the initial, let's say, right holder, to resell that digital copy then on. So uh, this is kind of anachronistic because if you know anything about the video game industry, you know that there are, first of all, key resellers and that everybody basically sells their own accounts, even though they kind of subjugate the whole, uh, the circumnavigate the whole EULA stuff. But still you have to consider the fact that even though this might be kind of um, gray in, in, the, in the gray area of the law, uh, I think that from a perspective of a consumer, it is reasonable for such digital exhaustion to be legal. I mean, since trading, since distance trading of goods is to be a reflection of physical trading, you know, as a consumer, I would have a legitimate expectation that I would have the same rights as with, you know, brick and mortar uh, distribution. So, for example, if I buy a digital copy of a game, if I get bored with the game, uh, you know, I should be able to sell it to someone else. But you know, these are uh, my 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 own views, and and definitely not a legal opinion. So, 
listen, guys, uh, that's 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 it for me. Uh, so if if you have any more questions, perhaps we can facilitate that right now. Uh, otherwise, um, we I'll, I'll I'll finish at at this. Unfortunately, abruptly. However, I think it's important for every every video game lawyer uh, to get a sense of video games as well uh, during the evening. So let's facilitate some time to that as well. Uh, by the way, uh, my, uh, small, small, small pun. Uh, I, uh, I, I do uh, serve this um, as an introduction in a sense to what I present usually at the ITTMT school uh, of Hugo Grossius uh, in, in the IP center. Uh, and I do a much more in-depth analysis of these topics. Uh, and this, this, this usually takes me more than six hours. So uh, apologies for not being able to um, um, abridge my 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 uh, my content, but hopefully uh, you will get uh, you have got some 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 insights from from my experience and and general uh, topics legal topics from the video game industry. Thanks, Steve. I think you're muted. Sorry, I'm back. Uh, thank you so much, Kuba. That was amazing. It's uh... It's touched everything. There were moments when I, it took me back to my childhood. And I remember talking about computers at Christmas. My first computer was a Spectrum 16K with a 32K RAM pack that just kept falling off the back. So and <laughs> games, games screeching at you to upload from a cassette player. So it, it was nice to be taken back to, to that and then brought right up to the future uh, and, and beyond. So uh, it's been uh, an absolute... Uh, whirlwind tour of, of, of everything. Um, and it's quite obvious that you're very passionate about this, have an enormous yeah. amount of experience uh, with it. And I'm sorry, if we could give you uh, six hours, it should be me the one who's apologizing rather than you, because I'm sure the audience would love to hear you talk more about it. And um, maybe we can organize some kind of a follow-up session on this or on something could, else later. Could, uh, later I, I would be more than happy to uh, do a continued version. So let's maybe treat this as to be continued because as you see, I would want to touch upon loot boxes, uh, modding, emulation, user-generated content, abandonware, which is my favorite subject as an IP lawyer. Loot boxes again, I mean, are, I'm, I'm, um, I'm engaged with, uh, uh, with several industry uh, lobbying groups. So uh, right now, what I can say is that it's it's less of a gambling law issue uh, and more of a, it's perceived more by the European Union more as a uh, consumer protection issue. So that's, uh, that's a teaser for uh, what may be in store for you guys later on if we uh, decide to, I, I'm very much open to do so, uh, if we decide to do a continued uh, uh, continued episode of this. So let's have this later on. And one big, huge topic to end all this, uh, to end all huge topics, <laughs> video game disorder. I mean, that is huge. And I think this is something that the video game industry still needs to tackle with. Uh, it's, it's a new, well, disease, basically. I mean, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about that as well. So listen, guys, thank you so much for, uh, for your attention on this. And we'll, we'll probably continue with Steve and with the scientific community of the University of Warsaw's uh, Faculty of Law and Administration, which I'm an alum of. Uh, I was uh, president of the IP uh, Law Society. So I'm very much fond of you guys listening in, and I'm very much happy to help you out with, uh, with the legal aspects of the video game industry. So thanks for listening in. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, of course. Th thank SSW Pragmatic Solutions as well. 
And you know what, I, I, we would love to have you back. So that's an absolute definite yes. And as you can see from the comments coming in, people are, people are saying yes, yes, yes. And there's lots of exclamation marks going on. So that's great. Um, and you've already introduced some topics, but you know what, it has a, a little bit of a Christmas present from us. I'll say, can you do us a slide on cyberpunk? And now you have an excuse to go away and play some cyberpunk over Christmas and you can call it research for, for our second visit. Sure, I'll, I'll definitely do one on the EULA, which uh, by the way, our, our friends at CD Projekt Red usually do a terrific job of um, not only, you know, um, figuring out how to protect their, you know, their developers' interest, their sole client's interest, but also how to communicate these interests to the community. I mean, CD Projekt Red is, is, is a beacon of hope in the video <laughs> game industry to me. So, but uh, I, I, would, I would, yeah, that would be a good idea to look into the EULA and how they tackle the issue of how to communicate specific law provisions. So Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, for tonight, Skuba, thank you very, very much. Thank you to everyone who, who's joined us and I uh, wish you a very, very lovely evening and we will see you uh, soon, but probably after the 25th of December. So to everyone uh, who is here who won't be coming to regular BLC lectures from tomorrow, have a wonderful Christmas too. Um, so great. And we, we'll see each other uh, uh, before that, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. You you Thank you very much Thanks. again. And Merry Christmas also. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>